Uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Jeff Whitty, for a few opening remarks, and then we will move on to our presentations. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marshall. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. You know, as, as we, uh, we began looking at the forecast for the winter months and the, in the spring, it became pretty obvious that La Nina was not going to treat us very well. Uh, and whether it does or not, I wanted our farmers and ranchers to have every opportunity to, to have the best information they could as they make decisions for what they're going to be growing uh, next, next growing season and, and how much hay or feed they're going to have to buy for their cattle. What... Uh, uh, options there are out there with uh, USDA and, and others possibly to uh, help mitigate some of the risk and in, in, uh, uh, either through insurance programs or farm uh, farm bill type programs. And so this is the second in the series. This one's dedicated to, to the folks up in the north. And I want to thank Paula Garcia and, and the others who've helped get the word out and, and, uh, and really you know, with the outreach, because I think it's going to be critical part of our part of our job and going forward is to make sure that our farmers and ranchers have every every opportunity for success. And so I also want to thank Marshall and Tom Dean and Janet and Danielle for all the, the work in putting this together as well. So with that, Marshall, I want to turn it over to, to you guys and, and just once again, thank you everybody for for participating. The thing is being recorded, so it'll be available for others who, who weren't able to make it tonight. But thank you for your time. Marshall? Thank you, sir. Um, our first speaker tonight is Mr. Royce Fontenot. He's a senior service hydrologist with the National Weather Service out of Albuquerque. Um, I, we have Royce on the phone. And so Royce, give me a little bit to put up your slides and then we uh, will be ready. No problem. I'll uh, start with the title slide when you get it up. Okay, can everybody see the slide? Yes, Marshall, we're good tonight. Okay. All right, I'll get started. Uh, thank you, Secretary Whitty, and thank you, Marshall. Uh, my name is Royce Fontenot. I am the Senior Service Hydrologist for the National Weather Service in Albuquerque. Uh, there are three National Weather Service offices that cover New Mexico. Uh, I am the only hydrologist physically in New Mexico. Uh, so I either support or um, act as a state liaison for all the counties here in the state. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Marshall. It should be, uh, what is the USDM? All right, so since we're gonna be talking about the US drought monitor here, as we're talking about the state of the drought, I, I kind of want to take a few minutes to just quickly talk about what the US drought monitor is. So uh, without getting into a long history, it's an attempt to represent all the different types of drought on one map and do so uh, science-based, data-driven, with a little bit of subjectivity, and that subjectivity mainly coming from regional inputs uh, and some impacts coming on, on the ground. But I, emphasize, I have to emphasize it's data-driven. So what are we trying to, to put all on this map? Meteorological drought, so what's that? You should have 10 inches of rain, you've got eight inches of rain, you're short two inches, therefore you're in meteorological drought. Agricultural drought should be no explanation needed for this audience. Hydrologic, um, this can this can come in various forms. Your river's running dry, certainly we've got dry stretches of the Rio Grande right now, uh, low snowpack. Um, I'll talk about ecological, then go back to socioeconomic. Ecological drought, really, when you're seeing the entire ecosystem, not just one sector, really Im impacted by drought. And then socioeconomic. And a lot of this one, this one sometimes confuses folks, but let's use some examples here. So if you're in a ski resort area, uh, like we saw a few years ago, where uh, the 2017-2018 winter, and you've got no snow, uh, your experience and your resort's not opening, your, your restaurants and your shops aren't servicing tourists, you're experiencing socioeconomic drought. If you are in a farming community and your business is based in supplying farmers and farmers are, are having trouble and not doing as much business, that's socioeconomic drought. So this is what we're trying to depict on this map. It's a competition between these, these five types of drought as well as different time periods, short-term drought, long-term drought. Long-term, generally, we're talking over a year to about two years. Um, 
all on one map and it's data driven. The data has to support anything on the map. So next slide, please, uh, the drought severity classification. And if you want to hit your key once, you should bring up a green bar. So this is found on the U.S. Drought Monitor's uh, website um, at, at the National Drought Mitigation Center. And this talks about the different categories on the drought monitor. So one thing I want to talk about is each one of these categories um, is has a statistic base to it. And so for and there's five categories. D0 is not considered drought. It's abnormally dry. If you go over to the right, hit your uh, key one more time, Marshall. It should bring up a red box on the drought severity classification, you'll see these objective indicators. So the basis of the drought monitor is we're trying to put a percentile to things. So a percentage of how many times in your historical record you should see it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, abnormally dry, 21 to 30% of your time, that, that's pretty common. And each one gets more and more infrequent. So when, by the time we get down to D4, we're looking at droughts that have an occurrence of zero to two percent of your time in your data record. You know, the really the, the droughts of record, and we use objective data. So we take the observed weather data in various forms, um, and we use objective indices. And each one of those has a statistical ranking to it. So. Well, a lot of people look at these possible impacts and go, oh, I'm seeing these impacts, and therefore I must be in D2. The reality is the data, um, it's a consensus, it's convergence of the evidence, looking at all these different indicators, the data has to support that. Now, certainly uh, there are times that we're right on the edge of those impacts reported, and that's why it's very important to have those. Um, we'll, we'll reshape some of that, but it has to be data supported. Uh, and the prime reason that from the history of the drought monitor is occasionally uh, the drought monitor authors have had to testify in front of Congress about it. And that's a hard and fast rule. Our data has to support it. So I just want to make sure everyone kind of understands what we're talking about when we're talking about the U.S. drought monitor, particularly for any presentations later, that the data drives us first and the, the impacts, a lot of people see this and they want to go to the impacts first. And those are possible impacts. Um, not necessarily uh, what's driving it. What's driving it is the data. And, and those impacts sometimes, the reason they're possible is they don't occur in all situations, and sometimes they may occur when the data doesn't support it because there's human management decisions in there as well. So um, they're trying to stick as much to the objective data as possible. So next slide, please, the current drought monitor. So here's the current U.S. drought monitor. And uh, they, so this is uh, the data that we use for the drought monitor ends on Tuesday mornings. Um, the, right now, we're actually in the deliberative process of, of each week. Uh, there's over 500 of us nationwide that work with the rotating author, the drop monitor, to produce this. It will come out to, uh, Thursday morning. Uh, right now, uh, New Mexico, approximately 66% of the states in D3 or D4. That's a, a large number. And again, we're, we're in that you know, very low category of drought. This is, this is abnormal. This is bad drought. But with about 7% right now in that D4 category. And you can see where it was, uh, where we were, uh, you know, start of uh, three months ago, only 15% was in D3, D4. So we'll talk about a little bit about that coming up. Really, the failure of the monsoon is what finally pushed things down. Zooming out to the region, certainly nothing happened in the vacuum, and, and New Mexico's uh, no different. Looking there regionally, though, you've got of the uh, six states here, and what's considered the Southwest, you've got almost 60% of those six states in D3 or D4, with 10% of that area in D4. So, you know, that failure of the monsoon certainly has had a huge impact across the region. You know, we've had a, a very, very active fire season in almost every state except for New Mexico. We've actually had a reasonably uh, low intensity fire year compared to the other states. So again, the drought's not just here, it's regionally, of course, that's uh, along with other things gonna affect uh, a lot of our industries here in New Mexico and water supply. Remember, two of our major rivers, the San Juan and the Rio Grande, their headwaters are in Colorado. So next slide, I uh, should say precipitation. Okay, this is a product from um, the Western Regional Climate Center out of University of uh, Nevada, Reno, uh, the University of Idaho, and Oregon State. It uses a data set called PRISM. And uh, the data cuts off here October 31st, but I really, you know, we haven't gotten really a lot of precipitation of note yet so far this month, but I really like the way these graphics put things. So going back to May, just going back six months or so, we can see um, we're, you know, five months, we're, we're really 
at the bottom of the barrel in a lot of spots. You know, we should have been getting some late season spring precipitation. Uh, of course, July, June is typically a dry month, half of May, June, and then in early monsoon. It's really been a failure. Looking over particularly the Four Corners region along the Arizona and New Mexico border, uh, parts of the Sangre de Cristos, parts of Colfax County there in the, the lowlands, and then, of course, southeast New Mexico, you can see, according to the PRISM data set, and, and it uses rain gauge data, and it, it's been reprocessed to have a very long record back about 80 years. Some of those areas are seeing these individual grid squares, the record driest for that time period. Uh, specifically focusing on monsoon season, which generally is considered July 1st through September 30th. You see the same sort of pattern there. One thing I'd like to point out, particularly over northeastern New Mexico, there you know, might be some folks out there going, wow, we, we, we really didn't have that great of a summer. This data is wrong. What this data doesn't account for, and a lot of these indices don't account for the temporal distribution, meaning you got rain on the first of the month, you know, in this July, September, let's say you had that monsoon rain event end of July, you had a pretty good rain event, but that was the only significant rain event you got from July through September. This data simply looks at what the totals are, that meteorological drought. So in reality, you had a dry first two thirds, uh, you know, 75% of July had a good precipitation event, and then the rest of the time period was fairly dry. This data doesn't account for that. So certainly uh, we see in the recent trends, even the recent snow events, you know, we're, we're pretty dry for that time period. So again, two monsoons in a row with a, a very low monsoon. And how this plays out, we'll talk about here in a minute, this is really devastating for soil moisture. And when we look in forward to winter water supply and spring runoff, this, this lack of a monsoon, two monsoons in a row is going to be pretty critical. So next slide, please, current snowpack. So this is from our colleagues over at the NRCS. They're the ones who run the snow observation network up in the mountains. Uh, on the left is the Rio Grande Basin. On the right is the San Juan. Uh, the individual smaller lines are the last several years. So you can see on the left that gold line at the top is 2019. Uh, really a stellar runoff here. Rio Grande saw some of the best runoff we've had in years on the, um, down on the Rio Grande system. We're out of Article 7 for the Rio Grande Compact. And at the very bottom, you can see the 2018 season, which was where uh, critically dry, uh, really there was areas, high elevation, no snow all year, ski resorts didn't open. And then you see that blue line to 2020. So what you're seeing in between those and, this, the, and then the little black on the bottom left is our current year. Uh, really over the last four years, we've seen this wide variety of swings. That green line's the normal. So when we look at last year, our snowpack wasn't great, but it was far from as bad as it could be. Uh, there's, there's far worse on record in there, but our runoff was one of the worst. Uh, and looking over on the right, the San Juan River Basin, same sort of distribution, did a little bit better last year. And actually you can see if you look real carefully at that black line, that system, that snow system that just came through really added some snowpack to the San Juan. So they're, they're looking pretty good compared to history right now, the normal. Uh, but you can see that too, even last year, not so bad. But again, poor runoff. And the reason why is that failure of the monsoon. The 2019 monsoon was was uh, really a pittance. Uh, the 2020 monsoon, as we know, has been fairly pittance. Those elevations, to get runoff, you got to have wet soils. And if you don't have wet soils, that snow is going to fill the soil before it rose into the river. So this is something we're looking ahead into the 2021 runoff season, knowing that we're going in with low snow moisture. So let's talk about that. Next slide, please, soil moisture. So this is a product from uh, NASA, a group called SPORT, where they're taking observed weather data, uh, satellite data on moisture, and uh, blending it with a model to kind of give us a soil moisture profile. And when we're talking about the column here, we're talking down to about six feet, two meters of depth. On the left is a two-week difference. The green means we've had some sort of increase. So over the last two weeks, and we had that really, really strong early season snow event, most of the state has seen a marginal increase in, in soil moisture up to about 2%. And depending on where you look at, you know, some of that's already gone. But let's look at the six month difference on the right. So that's when we're six months ago having our runoff, you know, where it should be, in, you know, really starting our runoff. And there you can see by and large, most of the state is still, even with that increase recently, still drier than the last six, than we were six months ago. Really only parts of the upper Rio Grande Basin and parts of the, um, 
uh, San Juan Mountains that come into New Mexico, parts of Sandoval County, and a little bit over eastern New Mexico are showing an increase. And really, if you look, that increase is only in the last two weeks. Uh, if we continue this dry pattern going through a few weeks, I would argue you will probably, uh, I would speculate you're going to see a lot of that go. So that means even from last year, we're, we're drier than we were. We should have seen some sort of increase over the monsoon, and we didn't. So let's talk a little bit about the outlook. Next slide, please. La Nina impacts. La Nina impacts, uh, kind of going through basically La Nina, colder than normal sea surface temperatures in the central Pacific Ocean uh, and around the equator. Uh, it's opposite of La Nina. What is El, uh, sorry, opposite of El Nina? What does La Nina typically do for us? Drier than normal conditions. That jet streams further north, drier, warmer than normal conditions. So next slide, please. November, January outlook. And sure enough, that's the outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, devil's always in the details here, but, you know, trending that if you roll that dice uh, six, to, uh, six times out of ten, it's going to come up with above normal in temperatures for November, December, January. Uh, for precipitation, same thing. Really, the southern two-thirds of New Mexico really strongly, you know, five times out of ten would come up as a below normal. Uh, really, for water supply in northern New Mexico, or really all of New Mexico, but we really want to see those that southern Colorado, very northern New Mexico, and it's still trending below normal. Next slide, please. And the winter outlook. This is December, January, February. We're expecting La Nina to be in full force. Again, the temperature outlook, and this is no surprise, above normal temperatures. Precipitation looking at below normal, still holding those chances, looking maybe a little bit better, a little bit on that edge with equal chances, meaning no real strong strong feeling either way for Colorado. So um, the devil's going to be in the details. We're still going to probably get some snow, still going to get some cold systems in there. Actually, La Nina tends to give us cold systems. But again, the prognosis, when we start looking, rolling that dice and, and seeing what those odds come up with, a uh, large chunk of New Mexico is still, you know, five. Well, that dice 10 times, five out of 10, you're going to come up with below normal. So our drought outlook, next slide, please, Marshall, and it should be the drought outlook. Uh, no surprise here, uh, through January 31st, expecting drought to persist. That doesn't mean we won't necessarily, if we start getting some, some decent precipitation events, start seeing some improvement, um, but still, we'll still remain at least D1 on the U.S. drought monitor. And for us to really start to see improvement, we really need to see winter to turn on and turn on with a fury. Um, and unfortunately, with La Nina, that tends not to happen. So a uh, final slide is just a closing slide. Um, so unfortunately, that's where we stand. Uh, we really uh, would like to see, before we do a solid solid freeze up around, you know, in, in the heart of winter, more systems like we just had where we get a, a good amount of wet snow that melts and gets into that soil and helps us keep that soil moisture moist before it freezes up. So uh, I am going to hop off after this. So I'm available for questions, Marshall. Thank you very much, Royce. Uh, I really appreciate um, you coming on and giving us that presentation. I know you have to get off in a little bit, so if anybody does have any questions, feel free to use the uh, Zoom chat function. Or if you would like to go ahead and unmute and ask a question, you can do that as well. Marshall, Jim Lissy out of Fort Sumner and uh, Royce. Good afternoon, good evening, y'all. Royce, I was looking at that uh, <coughs> The sole moisture that you showed off of uh, this last snow in the Baca County, Guadalupe County, and in, in the northwest part of uh, Chavez County, it bleeds into Lincoln County on that slide. I don't know if you want to bring it up, but anyhow, it's showing that we didn't get that much moisture, especially on that western part of the Baca County and into Guadalupe County in that southwest corner. But, you know, we're in a D3 right now. And when I brought this up, and I know a couple of ranchers have been contacting and, and trying to see about a D4, the economy and the, and the impacts that, that it has affected based on the first part of your presentation of the meteorological and the agriculture, hydraulic, and the, and the socioeconomic, economic, and the ecological. On all five of those avenues, it's, had, it's affected us, and so I was just out of curiosity, you know, what is it going to take in order for us to move based on the data of us having uh, in that area 50% below a rainfall for a uh, year to date, and then in 19, they didn't have very much rainfall for that area, and it bled and even back into 2018, so I was just going to kind of get your 
feel from it to see what your thoughts were and, and how that, that works on the U.S. Drought Monitor map. Hi, Jim. Yeah, we've had this conversation quite a bit, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, reemphasize, Marshall, if you want to go back to that uh, drought severity classification slide. Um, again, the, the percent of normal, believe it or not, is not really that good of a uh, indicator for drought. Um, that is not, and you see it's not really listed here as, as a possible indicator. Uh, percentage of normal is based off of a roaming 30-year normal. So it's, it's when we're looking at drought, the longer the data record, the better. Percentage of normal is not really that great. It goes back to this objective drought indicator blend. The impacts, and, and we've, we've had this discussion, but so others understand, the impacts they're aware of it. They It certainly helps in some of those decisions, but the data, the objective data, has to be able to support a consensus of evidence across these objective data. And let's look at soil moisture. And actually, soil moisture, you showed about 2% increase over the last two weeks, which, again, it's not much. It's, it's already out of the system. The objective data has to reach there, um, not the impacts, the objective data. Um, and that is a solid member. The drought monitor, and, and for those who don't know, is not was not intended for drought to trigger drought relief. That's not what it's operated for. Uh, it's not operated by the U.S. drought uh, by the USDA. Um, it was the 2014 Farm Bill that have tied these two together. So, you know, to get into that D4, the consensus of the evidence has to be that all the indicators, so the a good number of the objective indicators, are in that zero to two percentile. Currently, at you know, there's some indicators that are in that area. Some are not. Um, you know, we this is something certainly we have. Those of us who have input to the drought monitor and the drought monitor authors uh, have been watching for quite a long time. Um, we're very aware of the situation out there, certainly. Um, but as of now, and we have this discussion literally weekly, as of now, the indicators um, for a large part of the area are just not there. Um, that's certainly, like I said, we reevaluate that every week. Uh, but it, it has to be driven by not impacts. Impacts help shape it. Um, but the bottom line is the objective data has to be there. And, and we don't look at, a lot of people talk about 2019. We look at, we look at time periods, but we don't really, um, year to date, uh, and even water year to date is somewhat of a subjective date. We usually look at um, time periods, days past, so many months from where we are currently. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, the, the, like I said, the, the key issue there, it is it's data-based and the convergence of the evidence on the data is just not there for widespread D4. There is D4 uh, quite a, you know, relative quite a bit in the state, um, but unfortunately for a lot of areas, it's just not there yet. Thank you, Royce. We do have a question that came into the chat. Um, what are the measurements used to measure and display the socioeconomic drought? You know, that one's tough, and that one's kind of a, a side indicator. That's, you know, um, it's not one that's common. Not all areas really to do that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, for example, in the 2017-2018, that was kind of an anecdotal um, uh, input that we, a lot of us in Colorado, really the Western U.S., uh, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, had, had input back that hey, we're skiing ski resorts. So there's no one one real hard indicator. The the real um, it's just somewhat there, something they're trying to cover, um, but the prime indicator again, the prime mover is the basis, is the scientific observed hydrometeorological data, what's going on with the weather, what's going on with evapotranspiration, soil moisture, all these other things. So um, there's no hard and fast one. That's one that's kind of a secondary and probably the, the least common on there um, and certainly the most difficult to explain. Thank you, sir. We do have one more question uh, from Jim Lissy. What objective data does each county need for the U.S. Drought Monitor to show evidence? Hey, Jim, again, we've, we've had this discussion quite a bit, you and I. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, up to 48 different data sets. We don't work by counties. Uh, matter of fact, when they draw the lines, they turn the county boundaries off. Counties are artificial political boundary that, that really have nothing to do with um, how we draw the map. We don't look at when they draw the map. They may use counties as reference. For example, if we say, hey, we're getting reports out of here, but when they go to draw this map, they're not looking at counties. They turn political boundaries off and, and make those edits um, when they do their first cut. So it's, it's you know, Cocoa Raw certainly is something people can help and measure rain in real time. 
uh, and snow and be active in Cocoa Ross. Um, that helps us improve things, and we do use that data. That helps particularly in eastern New Mexico, where we have large swaths. Um, but, you know, we you know we often get this question, well, this state has done this. And, well, when the drought monitor authors do it, certainly they, they, they are aware of the political boundaries. But when they draw the line, they turn that layer off. So, um, you know, I, I would say if folks are interested in helping out, and, and certainly the uh, – uh, I think Anthony Chavez is on again tonight. He can talk about how they're using some of the Coca Raws data. If he is, Coca Raws is a great way to get involved. Um, that helps us not just for drought, helps us for um, when we're doing you know uh, winter storm assessments, uh, all sorts of things. Our river forecast centers use that Coca Raws data every day to adjust their rainfall estimates. But again, uh, that's the best way. I think citizen it's citizen science. It's it started. It's not a weather service program. It started out of Colorado State about twenty something years ago. That's the best way to help. Um, but uh, like I said, we try to be an honest broker in here, and this is a complication. I really have to emphasize this, that the drought monitor was never created, intended, or is funded or operated to trigger drought relief programs. It certainly can be used that way. The United States Congress certainly made that decision. Um, but when we're drawing the drought monitor, when we're doing input, it's pure, you know, we certainly pass along the impacts we get. Uh, that's something that we uh, virtually every state and every person who contributes to the drought monitor does. But the bottom line is the objective weather data, uh, those derivatives, you know, soil moisture and those things have to support any designation on the drought monitor. Okay, uh, Lou, we did see your comment about not being able to view the map. And I just, uh, I, I wanted to um, remind everybody that Royce has, has graciously offered to make his slides available in PDF. So we will be sending those out after the meeting as well. So you can review them on their, on your, uh, at, at your leisure. Royce. Hey Marshall, if anyone wants to go to the drought monitor directly, uh, I'll give the web address real quick. Okay. And we if can you can't see it. Yeah, drought monitor, one word, dot UNL. Uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. dot edu. So droughtmonitor. dot unl. dot edu. And there they've got all sorts of information on the drought monitor. I believe they have some videos of, of the background, um, all these charts. You can look at historical data. The drought monitor goes back to about 1999. Um, it's a fairly recent thing, uh, but uh, they have all sorts of inf data, and that's kind of really. Um, Really a great place to start if you got questions about the drought monitor. Thank you very much, Royce. We we really appreciate your partnership, and I'm not seeing um, any more questions in the chat. So uh, once again, we really appreciate appreciate your presentation. Hey, not a problem, anyone, and you know, everyone, stay safe out there. And uh, like I said, please, if you have questions on Coco Ross too, we can um, we can get you hooked up with those people. So, all right, everyone have a great evening and uh, thank you veterans. If you're any veterans on the call for Veterans Day tomorrow. Thank you for your service. All right, Marshall, while we're transitioning a little bit, um, we had some folks that come on a little later. I wanna remind everybody if you would do us a huge favor and put your name and the county that you're from in the text chat. Uh, that would greatly help us in disseminating some more information out. Thank you, Tom. Our next presenter uh, on behalf of the New Mexico Aseki Association is Paula Garcia. And so Paula, if you have any uh, slides to share, you're able to do that. You're, the floor is yours. Sure. Okay, good evening, everyone. Still getting used to Zoom over here. It's good to see a lot of familiar names and familiar faces. And um, I'm gonna get, try to get this thing started. I'm gonna take it. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see that still. Is it is it share screen yet? Um, so Paula, I think you actually stopped sharing your screen there when you backed okay. out. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Okay, share screen. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Paula Garcia, and I'm the executive director of the New Mexico Sick Association. And I wanna uh, thank Royce for a really informative presentation. It was, um, it was affirming because I think a lot of us who are on the ground as gardeners or farmers uh, know that, there was, that we're in a serious drought and to see the actual data is, um, I think it's, it's, um, it's very sobering. Um, but it's, it's just interesting to see the, the data that backs up our actual experience. So I'm going to be presenting on a second perspectives on drought. And I wanna thank uh, NMSU and the Southwest Border Food Protection and Emergency Preparedness Center. I think this is a very important and timely workshop. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with, with everyone. And there's a wonderful turnout this evening. So I really appreciate being here. I just wanted to start reminding us that how variable our precipitation has been over the centuries in, in New Mexico and keeping in mind that the Asequias in New Mexico have been enduring high variability in precipitation for two to 400 years in New Mexico. And what we're observing now is um, something that's, that's unprecedented in most of our lifetimes. So uh, that's, that's, that's what I wanna be sharing with you this evening is, is less of the technical data and more of the um, experiential data or observation that ASECAs are, are making through their own um, experience on the ground and what are some of the strategies that ASECAs use to, to deal with drought that are based in longstanding traditions that are centuries old and um, also adaptations to more of a, a modern context. Uh, first wanted to share with you um, the extent of a sequest throughout New Mexico. And I realized that, that uh, this, this workshop is focused on Northern New Mexico and certainly a are concentrated in Northern New Mexico, but there are, there are several a in other parts of the state. And uh, on, on all of these river systems and tributaries to major rivers, uh, you, you can see that there are hundreds of acequias and uh, we estimate there are close to 700 acequias. We, we have relatively recent contact information for 640 in New Mexico and each acequia has its own commissioner, uh, commission, three member commission and a mayordomo. And each acequia is unique in its customs and traditions for how that acequia allocates water. Um, this should be a familiar image. Royce was uh, sharing much more data, but um, I thought I'd include it just for context, just to remind ourselves of, of how extreme the drought is here in the Southwest and in New Mexico, and to see that that much red and orange is somewhat alarming. And uh, it, it does confirm what we're observing on the ground. Um, in order to prepare for tonight, one of the things I did was to reach out to Asequias around the state and ask how they were um, dealing with drought this year and knowing that we're going to have a uh, continued drought in the in next year and possibly in coming years um, that there's some a lot we can learn from the experience that was experiences that we've had in in the recent years of drought so in in 2020 these are some of the major observations that that were um, shared with me and, and starting early in the spring, one of the major uh, concerns that, that we had was that the snowpack that we anticipated turning into runoff, just it never materialized. And the, the NRCS Basin Outlook um, in their April report um, noted that in April, there were such extreme temperatures, um, more than 10 degrees above normal, that the, the snowpack that was there um, never, never turned into runoff, it sublimated. 
And this is something that was observed in, from Asekias all over. Um, and in the Taos region, this, the, uh, they noted that the snowpack appeared promising, but then um, the, the early spring was very hot and the valley actually had a very short irrigation season. Um, one irrigator in Mora noted that the rivers completely dried. Um, there were very low flows from the very beginning and there was virtually no, no, no runoff and very, very, um, very little monsoon. Uh, where there was runoff, it did not last long. Um, well, we noted that on the Rio Chama, there was a, a, a runoff, but it peaked early and they had to go into curtailment um, by, by June. And the only reason they were able to, ir to irrigate somewhat later was, was due to some um, fancy footwork and, and maneuvering with, uh, with debit water and um, due to, due to some, some advocacy efforts by Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District to get water down to the Middle Rio Grande. So uh, we'll talk more about that later. Others observed that this drought was as bad as the 1950s and that which um, in, in that case, the, the Rio Mbudu was dry most of the summer. I wanted to share with you some uh, cultural context from the Asequias. Uh, the repartimiento is our custom of sharing water or sharing shortages, depending on, on how you want to frame the sharing. But the point is, is that they're sharing and it's coordinated and they're, it's rooted in, in a, a cultural tradition and it's also um, rooted in practice and, it, and it's something that has to be practiced um, in order to, to remain current and to remain relevant. The repartimiento it refers to the way water is divided. It's between parciantes within an acequia and between acequias who share a the same stream system. Um, there's centuries of the repartimiento in New Mexico. It's a very important um, uh, uh, practice for acequias and it's, it's, a, it's been a long time adaptation to variability in stream flows. The, the repartimiento is actually codified in state law in the acequia article. Um, as an exception to prior appropriation. Um, there's a statute that says that Asequias can gather every spring and figure out how they're gonna allocate water between them. Uh, since the 2000s, the, the repartimiento has been affirmed in, in um, state regulation as part of active water resource management. And um, the state will refer to water sharing agreements as a form of or a subset of alternative administration. Um, so this is this is a repartimiento is an ancient practice, but it's also a, a modern strategy for dealing with water shortages. For purposes of this presentation, I'm I'm referring to two different kinds of water sharing, and one is an autonomous water sharing, um, rooted in the tradition of the repartimiento. And the reason I refer to this as autonomous water sharing is that, that there are secchias who, who have a, a deep tradition and are, are taking the initiative to um, practice their custom, adapt their custom, and um, doing so without any um, coercion or, or, um, or imposition by any kind of other authority like the state. Uh, so autonomous water sharing is happening in places all, all over the state. And um, just two examples that I'll share with you is uh, from Embudo, Valley Asequi Association, and um, Taos Valley Asequi Association, and uh, got some really good reflections from leaders in those areas about, um, about their long-term traditions and also how they're adapting to drought as it, um, as it, continues and doesn't seem to, to be going away that it's forcing people to get creative and um, adapt their sharing customs to, to, the, to the severity of the drought that we're having. Um, in Embudo, uh, they noted that, that they did put their custom into place, but more work has to be done to, to have a, a, a sharing agreement that addresses the lower acequias. And you know I think that's a... a, a um, and it's an observation that I appreciate. And in the Taos Valley, there's, um, which has the most concentration of acequias in the state, um, they're working on developing um, 
commissions on each stream to to de develop sharing uh, shadow sharing agreements and um, in the Taos Valley Sake Association, they have longstanding um, shortage sharing customs and um, including sharing with, with the Pueblo and each of the stream systems was able to uh, work uh, together this year to, to share shortages. Um, I'm also going to refer to an, a, a whole other category of repartimiento as alternative administration. And in these ones, the state engineer is involved in some way. And um, it's important to note that these, these agreements are, are often developed by, from the grassroots by SECAS, but the OSC has some role um, because of a water rights settlement or some other legal framework that, that provides parameters or shapes how the shortage sharing has to take place. Um, so um, actually I should have included Anton Chico should have been on the autonomous water sharing. They're not involved with the OSC. They have a self-selected wa water master, which is a, an interesting framework um, that that's, uh, was um, uh, part of a court decree since the 70s. So they have a, a water master that they select from among themselves, not a water master from the state engineer. So I would recategorize that. But some of the places where um, this type of alternative administration is happening is in Jemez, Rio Gainas, and the Rio Chama. And in the middle Rio Grande, there are uh, sequias within the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, and that's a completely different water uh, management regime. On the Jemez uh, Basin, there was a, there is a sharing agreement in place between the sequias and the Pueblo. Pueblos, the downstream Pueblos, Jemez and Zia. And um, in a dry year like 2020, the sequias get water one day and Pueblos get it for six days. On the Rio Gainas, there's a shortage sharing agreement between the Asequias, about 11 Asequias and the city of Las Vegas. And in that agreement, the water master is very involved with um, monitoring that and managing the, the flows in the river to the different uh, diversions. So there's some detailed, I borrowed this from the state engineer, <clears throat> state engineer's presentation. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about the HEMIS is that the state engineer monitors compliance of the shortage sharing agreement between the Asequias and the Pueblos. And uh, Gilbert Sandoval reported to me that they were 95% compliant. So I told him they got an A plus this year. Um, the Rio Chama is a special case. And um, I, I actually, I wanna thank the the secular leaders who are on the call today, because I, I, I did notice that uh, um, uh, Harold Trujillo is on the call, Tim Seaman, Rob Templeton, uh, Juanita Lavadi, and, and other uh, secular leaders who, who are involved in, in maintaining these traditions and these practices and um, these agreements. Uh, the Rio Chama is a, is a really special case because they're, they're on the Rio Chama and they're in the middle of um, state and federal agency management of the river. Uh, even though they have very old priority dates, they're curtailed at a certain threshold. And once the um, river gauge upstream from them reaches a certain point, they go into curtailment and then they have to um, start to short, uh, share shortages. So there are, are three senior ditches, including the Pueblo and um, several other more junior ditches. And you can see how they, how they do a uh, Somewhat priority, but but it's also a shortage sharing because everybody gets something um, even when there's a, there's shortage. Uh, it was noted that that uh, in all these places, even even where they shared shortage, there was hardship because there just wasn't enough water to go around. Um, the only reason Rio Chama got a slightly longer growing season was that um, some debit water was released from El Vado at the request of Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, and um, the uh, that helped to offset the transit losses for the Rio Chama Sequias, and they were able to uh, use some water that they had in their irrigation reserve that they've uh, built up by purchasing um, storage water from San Juan Chama contractors. So um, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated water, water sharing system. In the South Valley uh, within MRG, MRGCD, there's a completely different management regime. There, there isn't really a priority between senior and junior except for the Pueblos um, next year, they're expecting to start the irrigation season later, and 
there's going to be some late season forbearance um, to, to try to leave water in the river for endangered species. Um, looking ahead, um, it's um, in Joyce covered, uh, Royce covered this earlier, so I won't get into detail. Um, wanted to thank Sig Sibler for sharing some, some of his data with me. And I, I borrowed this uh, outlook from, from another presentation. And um, just to reiterate a lot of what Royce was saying that there's um, uh, higher than normal um, uh, temperatures in the next three months. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether there'll be a monsoon next year. And so I think, you know, there's some likelihood that we're in for continued drought. Um, this is one graphic that shows a little bit of uh, the snow accumulation so far. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed. And I uh, just wanted to, sh to, to um, we, we ha held two meetings in the past year. One was a drought, drought summit and another one was a conference on climate change um, that was sponsored along with some of the regional associations. And uh, David Gutz Gutzler was our, our, our keynote and shared with us what, what um, climatologists are saying in terms of climate change and how it's impacting us, that we can continue to see increasing temperatures, which is very difficult if you're a farmer, because if you have less water and higher temperatures, um, you know, it's difficult because the, your plants have a higher demand for water when it's hotter. Um, but one, probably one of the bigger impacts is that snowpack is decreasing and melting earlier. Uh, precipitation is less certain and more variable and precipitation is more extreme and droughts are intensified by warmer climate. Uh, those, those are all um, observations that we're making. And just to summarize where um, in reaching out to different leaders around the state, um, I asked about how they were planning to continue adapting in 2021. And um, one of the major points was continued vigilance on shortage sharing agreements. There are some areas that have uh, uh, very well-developed agreements and that are continuing to evolve, and, but it's very variable. There are other places where um, the agreements are not so well-developed and, and there's still a lack of understanding about what their custom is. And so there's a lot of communication that has to happen um, one of the more innovative things that I heard about was the um, stream commissions that the that, that TVAA is contemplating for the Taos Valley. And they're, start, where they're planning to have one in place for the Rio Fernando by next year. Um, in general, there's, there's a need for a more robust safety net for farmers and ranchers. Um, some producers reported that they did benefit from some FSA disaster programs, but others reported that there have been some changes at FF, FSA that cut them off from participation, um, such as NAP. And so that's, that's a, a big concern to a lot of Asequia producers. Um, they're in, in the South Valley, they're gonna be doing workshops on how to apply for a supplemental well. This is a very challenging topic. Um, and in general, I think we like to encourage people to, to prioritize surface water use and, and, and uh, share water. Um, Supplemental wells are like a last resort, but and they're not typical in a sacred country. So this is a major shift and maybe an inflection point, um, and could have a lot of implications for water management in the future. Um, there's possibly a greater appreciation for locally grown food, and and um, that that also has implications for second management in terms of of um, prioritizing certain crops or livestock. Um, when there is shortage, and, and that definitely comes into play when communities are trying to decide how to allocate water. Um, some farmers are trying to adapt to drought tolerant crops and saving local seeds and land races that are more adapt, uh, adapted to dry conditions. Um, where it's possible and available, um, and there are only a few places in the state where Asekis have access to storage, but places like the Rio Chama are, you know, um, seeking to acquire more storage to mitigate the shortages on their stream system. And in those places that do have storage, um, there's, there's a need to, to continue to maintain those dams and remove silt so that they can store water um, to a greater extent to, to, to uh, again, supplement their, their supply during the growing season. 
So there's a, a lot of um, effort to continue the Ezequiel tradition at, from various Ezequiels around the state. So there's a lot of work going on. And um, we're hopeful that, the, that there will be some water and as, as low as it can get, um, there are always efforts to, to share the little bit that there is so that everyone can get, get some water. And this is a very localized and very grassroots and participatory decision-making process. Uh, communication is really important. This is a picture from our, our drought summit in um, 2018. And this is where we, we were really encouraging us, I guess, to come to a, a, an understanding about their custom, revisit it, update it, adapt it, and, and most of all, talk to each other with respect. Uh, we, we actually had another uh, meeting this year called Respeto y Repartimiento, which respect and water sharing, which emphasized the cultural aspects of sharing water. So lastly, uh, our hope for the future is that Ezequias will live long and uh, que vivan las Ezequias. We're, we're going to continue to, to be um, cautiously optimistic about, about being able to continue to irrigate. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paula. It's, it's especially interesting to see some of the strategies that the Asakias are coming up to, to deal with uh, the upcoming challenges. Thank you. So we do have a few moments if anybody has a question for Paula. Um, once again, please feel free to use the chat or if you would like to go ahead and, and unmute yourself and ask a question. Paula, you had mentioned something about uh, as a last resort, figuring out a way to drill a well or get some get water that way. Mm -hmm. You said somebody's going to help with that. Can you give me some more information? There's a, an organization in the South Valley called the South Valley Regional Associ uh, South Valley Regional Association of Asequias, and they're um, they're planning to do workshops on that. And um, I, I can, if you, if you uh, chat with, send me a chat, I could, I could uh, get you some follow-up information about that. All right, thank you. Paula, we also um, had a side question. Will, you, will your slides be made available? If, yes. If, thank you very much. We have another question in the chat. Is there any effort to fight salt cedar? The, um, the, the soil and water conservation districts are, are the entities who take the lead on dealing with, with uh, noxious weeds and things like salt cedar. And, and uh, so our, our association is not, but a lot of our leaders are involved with both their acequias and the soil and water conservation districts. And so, yeah, there, there are numerous efforts around the state to, to, uh, to address that concern. Thank well, you. Nick Maestas, on the Pecos River, are we expecting to have a, uh, a dry spring, a dry winter, or can we expect some moisture? Oh, I do not. You know, um, the uh, in in looking at at um, <clears throat> before and, and I didn't include it all in my presentation, but um, in in looking at um, some of the information that was provided by um, Sig Zibler and and trying to forecast into the next three three, three to six months, um, the next three months are, are looking um, like they're going to have um, above normal temperatures, and that's. Uh, that's not, a, it's not a good sign that it's, it seems like we're still in the, the La Nina cycle. And as long as there's a La Nina cycle, it seems like we're going to be um, drier. And, and that's, you know, there's, there's a, it depends on, on a lot of different factors, whether, whether there's going to be some precipitation over the winter, but it's, it's at this point, I think it's looking somewhat dry. Thank you, Paula. And we will um, leave a little bit of time for questions at the end of all presentations. And so uh, please continue. If you have a question, feel free to, to put it in the chat and we will revisit it once we get through all of the presentations. 
thank you again, Paula. That was very interesting. Our next presentation um, will be by Lily Conrad. She is presenting on behalf of the Sustainable Agriculture Science Center at New Mexico State University. And so Lily, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Marshall. And thank you for all of the other presenters that have gone this evening. It's always really great to hear about the work that is going on around our country and specifically in our state. Um, Paula, it's great to hear about the acequias always. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for my presentation. Okay, do you guys see the presentation in full screen? Yes, ma'am, we can see it. Wonderful. Um, so my name is Lily Conrad. I am a master's student in NMSU's water science and management program. Um, my thesis is working with the acequias of the Rio Hondo Valley up in Taos County. Um, doing some monitoring on the ditches up there. Uh, but today I'll be focusing more on uh, summarizing recent trends in precipitation and stream flow that we've been seeing throughout Northern New Mexico. Uh, Dr. Steve Gildan, the director at uh, the Science Center here in Alcalde, and I worked together to put these slides together for you guys. Um, and I just wanna start off by saying that all of the data that we use to generate these figures or the figures that I found online are all publicly available um, that anyone can find online. Um, I included all of the links on the bottom left portion of the slides. So Marshall, I'm fine with these slides being made available. And if anyone is interested in trying to access the data and the information for themselves independently, um, all you would have to do is click on those uh, links at the bottoms of the slides. So today I'll just be doing a little report on the recent precipitation that we've been seeing uh, this year and in the past few years um, in several different areas in northern New Mexico, as well as some discharge data from USGS data sources. So I'll go ahead and get started with precipitation first. Um, our first figure here is showing the precipitation that the weather station here at Alcalde has recorded. Um, or no, sorry, this was from NOAA. Um, we do have a weather station here at Alcalde, but that's not what these data are. Um, so you can see that this blue line is the long-term data set, so representing monthly averages from the years of 1953 to 2016. This orange line is the precipitation that we saw in 2019. And then this gray line is the precipitation that received um, through October for 2020. And you can see that uh, the long-term uh, annual precipitation that Alcalde generally receives is around 8.9 inches. 2019 was a bit of a wetter year with 9.1 inches and then 2020 was much drier, only um, accumulating about 5.6 inches. Um, our next figure is from a weather station in Arroyo Hondo. Um, and in this case, we only have two years worth of data. Uh, the blue line, which is 2019 and the orange line which is 2020. Um, you can see that there is one notable difference in the precipitation patterns that we can see at this weather station that we didn't see in all call day, um, is that one of the uh, precipitation events in 2020 um, surpassed one of the peak precipitation events of 2019. Um, but overall, 2020 was much drier than 2019 with only about eight inches of rain, whereas uh, 11 inches were in total, uh, were received in 2019. And 2019 was much closer to average. Typically in the Rio Hondo watershed, um, 11.8 inches is the average annual precipitation. 
So 2019 wasn't far off of average. And despite this large peak, 2020 was much lower than 2019. And then our final precipitation gauge um, that we're reporting tonight is from a weather station in um, just south of Santa Fe. Uh, again, we only have 2019 and 2020 data. Um, oh, and I should mention all of these uh, numbers that I'm giving from the top right corner are the total precipitation values that have been collected through October so that we can compare previous years to 2020 since that's where we cut off the data for this year. Um, and again, you can see that 2019 received much more rain um, than 2020, kind of confirming what our other presenters were saying uh, and confirming on the ground um, the drought that we are currently enduring. Um, and now we will go over into kind of a stream flow report. So the first uh, stream flow station that I used, I just used USGS data, which is made publicly available online. Um, specifically with this one, I was looking at the Rio Hondo gauge station near Valdez, New Mexico, um, indicated by the red dot. It's in the Rio Hondo watershed, which drains about 400 square kilometers, and it's at the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the annual precipitation average for this basin is about 11.8 inches. Um, and over the course of this last year, it did receive um, less than that. So the great thing about these USGS uh, maps is once you find the gauge station that you're interested in or is nearest to you, you can custom tailor the time window uh, for the data that you want to retrieve. And so in this case, I wanted to see the data from the last three years. So here we have um, the runoff seasons for 2018, 2019, and then through October 2020. Um, First, a little bit about the legend. So we have these little orange triangles, which are the median daily values that the USGS has calculated um, based on the 85 years worth of data that they have from this specific site. Um, these blue lines are discharge values. The red lines are estimated discharge. Um, I believe that they sub these values in when there's either ice in the river or in the case of equipment malfunction. Um, to kind of serve as a proxy. And then they tell you uh, the period of approved data, which is this green line at the bottom, meaning that the data from this time window has um, undergone their quality control protocol and it's been approved. Whereas this more recent data indicated by the pink, pink purple line um, has yet to undergo the quality control protocol. So the reason that I picked this three-year time frame is because I think it shows the variability that we've been experiencing really well. So in 2018, you can see that it was a really dry year. Uh, 2019 was a really good year, surpassing the median uh, averages or the median daily statistics that they display on these graphs. And then 2020 wasn't too bad in comparison to 2019 for this basin specifically. Um, the main things to note are that the peak discharge in 2020 arrived earlier than the peak discharge in 2019. Um, this is a very common symptom of climate change and warming conditions that um, Paula kind of mentioned in the last presentation. Um, and then you'd also notice that the discharge line was consistently under the median daily statistic uh, for the entire uh, irrigation season for the entire summer going into the fall until we got some late fall precipitation. Um, and this is likely because of uh, less snowmelt, more of it going directly into the ground, less of it running off into our streams and rivers, and also a really weak monsoon season. Um, you can see in 2019, this blue discharge line was well above the median uh, daily statistic values for most of the summer, and then in the fall, it kind of dipped under. So those are some noticeable differences. Um, 
And then here I just pulled up uh, the, the snowpack summary for the Rio Grande Basin uh, from April 1st, 2020. So uh, it includes all of the sub basins. Um, and you can see the main differences here in the red boxes down below. Uh, 80, the snowpack from last winter was 80% of median, whereas the snowpack from 2019 or I guess this would have been 2018, 2019 winter, was well above the median uh, snowpack. And so that kind of demonstrates uh, some differences in the runoff that we saw this year. And then I just wanted to take a closer look at this year specifically um, by zooming into the 2020 calendar year here. You can really see that the peak discharge uh, arrived a lot earlier than it usually does. And then there's that really steep recession um, in the stream flow runoff. And these remarks um, stand true to what the community noticed. So I mentioned that I work with the acequias in the Rio Hondo Valley and just through my work in there, through conversation with the, with the acequia community, um, I just picked up a few observations that the individuals have um, in comparison to previous runoff years and previous irrigation seasons um, was that there was earlier snowmelt. They saw the runoff come earlier, which it did according to this USGS figure. Um, and the effects of the snowmelt runoff passed quickly. So they saw a lot of water, but then it kind of stopped and then the low flow was really felt in the middle of the season and water sharing um, had to be uh, adjusted. And also there was a really weak monsoon season where not very much rain fell over the course of the late summer. Um, and this also kind of reflects the remarks that Paula noticed from the Asekia communities that she was in communication with. And then I just wanted to highlight one more uh, USGS gauge station, uh, the one on the Rio Grande uh, at Embudo, New Mexico. It's about 43 miles uh, north of Santa Fe. And it was actually the first uh, USGS gauge station that they installed um, and implemented back in 1889 uh, in the country. So it's the oldest one, which is pretty cool. And here I just have the same graphs that I, I uh, had for the Rio Hondo Valley, uh, for the Rio Hondo gauge station. So this top one is for the last three years. And then this bottom graph is uh, just for the last calendar year. Um, and here you can see, again, 2018 was a really low flow season. 2019 was really good. And then 2020, it's actually more similar to 2018 when you look at this gauge station. So it just shows uh, it's a bigger basin. And so there was more drainage variability coming into it. And so the effects of drought are more pronounced on um, this graph. And then you can see uh, on the bottom graph, the discharge value was well below the median. So um, less flow in the Rio Grande as well. And that was pretty much it. I would just like to uh, say I, I didn't really provide very much of a, an outlook going forward, but I would really recommend uh, everybody to use these tools from the NRCS, the snow survey with the snow tell sites, the USGS gauge stations, find the one closest to you and you can check it whenever you want. Um, and then uh, all of the weather databases that are available to us, like NOAA um, is really reliable. Um, I'd highly recommend keeping tabs on those things. Um, I think it's a lot of fun over the winter, checking the snowpack every so often. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments now um, or wait until the end, whatever is best. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Lily. It's, it's um, one thing to know it's dry, but it's quite startling to see it uh, presented, presented in the way you did on your graphs. So thank you for that research. Do we have any questions? I have a comment. Go ahead. Can you hear me? 
My name is Edwin Gurule, I'm from, I'm from Ria Riva. My comment is that when I was growing up, if it rained in Santa Fe, it rained in Española, it rained in Taos, it rained over Tres Piedras. And now with this, uh, the way you guys are, are measuring water, I can have an inch at my place down the road a quarter of a mile, they don't get anything. So like your graphs aren't really that accurate. Uh, the USGS ones or the precipitation ones? Yeah, yeah, the precipitation ones and stuff like that. No, because, <clears throat> you know, I was noticing like there in, or do, where were you in Hondo or whatever, you know, it seemed like it compared pretty much in June or July, like last year. And uh, a lot of us, I think, can agree on that because we were really dry. Yeah, so if you look at the totals, um, it was a lot drier than the previous years. There was just a few large events, um, but overall it's a lot drier. And these are just monthly averages. And so that's why the lines look a little more jagged than uh, they normally would if you used like hourly data. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of precip variation. Um, and especially in, uh, I'm in Alcalde here. Uh, it never rains here. It's like weird if it rains. Um, so there, there is a lot of variability just from a lot of spatial variability from location to location. Well, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. So thank you again, Lily. We really appreciate it. Moving on to our final presenter for this evening from the Farm, Farm Service Agency, we have um, with us Mr. Anthony Chavez. And um, I believe I saw him earlier. There, Anthony, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Marshall, let me see if I can share my screen. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Let me see what I got. Oh. I thought I could do this, I see. Um, I don't know, let me see. Huh, okay, let me see if I can get this to work. Is it sharing it yet, Marshall? We're not seeing anything yet. Oh, huh, okay. Why is this? I got it to work a second ago. Okay. Can you see it yet? We can see PowerPoint. Okay, let me see if I can get it to the beginning. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, you just see the, the main side? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, well, good evening. My, uh, my name is Anthony Chavez and I'm with the USDA FSA out of Albuquerque and I'm the uh, one of the state specialists responsible for uh, disaster programs. And so um, my slideshow, that's just more of a placeholder for me. So I know where I'm at. Uh, it doesn't really, I don't have any graphs too much, but just on what the Farm Service Agency is, as far as the FSA, um, we're part of the USDA and we administer the programs uh, that provide the safety net for farmers and ranchers. Uh, just to remind everybody, we are open. I mean, we're an agency, uh, we're customer driven agency. Um, with a really multi-talented uh, workforce. Um, our mission is to equally serve all farmers and ranchers and agricultural partners um, on our programs. Even with COVID and other things that are going on, our offices are open for business. So um, we have to adapt different ways of how we're handling our, 
uh, constituents. We may have to do <clears throat> appointments. Uh, some offices aren't allowing people in. So we're having to just kind of adjust how we actually are conducting business now in, in the new era. And so with that, we may have to do outside appointments or we might have to do everything totally on the phone. So um, just ask that you be patient with our, our staff and all of our county offices, but we are open for business to help uh, our constituents. So the programs I'm gonna just talk about, I'm gonna leave it on this slide for a little bit, are gonna be, uh, all of these programs aren't necessarily specific to drought, so but they are all the disaster or loss programs that we have. So um, just a little bit of history. Prior to uh, the 2014 Farm Bill and, and in the 2008 Farm Bill, any disaster assistance that was needed by any state or uh, entity, you had to make a request of the either the administrator or the secretary or the president to declare an, a, a secretarial designation or a presidential emergency declaration for emergency funding for a disaster event. Um, so you're, you'll see sometimes that things come out from USDA or from the FSA that uh, it's been declared an emergency by, or the secretarial has made a, um, uh, an emergency declaration uh, granting um, services based on on the declaration. The 2014 Farm Bill actually put these programs into law. So by with the establishment of the 2014 Farm Bill, <clears throat> um, secretarial designations were not necessary to establish uh, losses due to uh, adverse weather events or disasters. So now whenever we get uh, a secretarial designation, Traditionally, they're pretty well specific to emergency loans. So um, pretty much every county in the state of New Mexico at this point is under some type of secretarial designation, which has designated that emergency loans are available to uh, producers, farmers and ranchers. Uh, the, little th the little nuances about emergency loans is um, they're eligible for both farmers and ranchers. Uh, that meet eligibility requirements of a loan. One of the things on the emergency loan system is you have to actually have been um, unable to receive credit from a commercial source. So you would have had to have gone to some type of commercial source, whether it's farm credit or a commercial bank and been turned down for a loan to be eligible to uh, receive emergency loan assistance. So that's one option. Um, these are open, uh, our loan programs are go towards producers and individual producers. Aseki associations aren't eligible for our loan programs. So that's that's also something we need to be, we need to be cognizant about. Uh, the loans are up to $500,000 <laughs> for a maximum of loan amount. And they are fully collateralized, which means that they have to be uh, secured by something. Uh, it could also be just collateralized by your uh, your ability to pay it back, whether it's uh, with actual hard um, equipment or the actual uh, product that you're growing, or or it actually could just be your ability to be able to get it back. So emergency loans. So whenever you see the emergency declarations from the secretary, pretty much they are designated to the emergency loans program. <clears throat> LFP is the first, uh, it's the Livestock Forage Program, and the Livestock Forage Program provides uh, assistance to ranchers for their loss uh, due to um, uh, drought. So we are a consumer of the drought monitor. We don't influence the drought monitor. We, we provide information to Royce and to his team, but we uh, do not influence that. We are a consumer of the drought monitor. So the last, uh, Livestock Forage Program actually provides assistance to ranchers when we meet a minimum drought under the US Drought Monitor. So for instance, <clears throat> every, every county in the state, again, this last year is under some kind of drought specification. So it starts with D2, once you're at D2 for eight consecutive weeks, you're eligible for one month payment of, it's a one month factor payment. It's not an actual one month payment of 
of your feed or anything. It's a, it's a factor that we utilize. Um, once you go into D3 drought, you're eligible for three months payment uh, factor. And once you have stayed in D3 drought for at least four consecutive weeks, you move into D4. Uh, once you get into D4 and you move into enough uh, into four weeks, cons uh, non-consecutive weeks, you can move into five payments. And you can only get a maximum of five payments. And it's to compensate ranchers for loss of forage on federal lands. So if you have federal leases, um, uh, BLM leases, U.S. Forest Service leases, it does also compensate for losses on state and private lands. <clears throat> and that's in reference to drought. LFP also compensates ranchers for loss due to wildfires. And so if there is a wildfire uh, you, on federal land, you can get compensated uh, by LFP for the loss to your forage on uh, wildfires. The next one is LIP, which is the Livestock Indemnity Program. Now the Livestock Indemnity Program, drought is not an eligible factor for losses to livestock. So this, this is only, for the loss of your livestock itself, but we do provide benefit if you lose your livestock due to an adverse weather event or which would be freeze, cold, excessive heat, um, any of those areas. And, and if you lose cattle or if you lose any livestock associated with it, or if you lose cattle due to an, uh, uh, an ineligible or an eligible attack by a predator. And the predator has to be uh, listed on the endangered species list and has to be introduced to uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service or by the U.S. federal government. So in this case, for New Mexico, it tends to be the Mexican wolf, uh, mostly on the western part of the state where uh, the Mexican wolf has, uh, there are depredations due to wolf attacks. But we do get some up north, uh, especially in uh, where we have producers that have a lot of lambs, um, sheep, where you get avian predators, whether they're eagles, hawks, uh, those types of things are also covered under um, losses under the LIP that you can apply for. ELAP is the next one. That's the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program. This is the catch-all for those uh, losses that don't fall into LFP or into LIP uh, fall to ELAP. So ELAP covers assistance and it is triggered by drought and it's utilized uh, for some programs within ELAP. And it is for specifically when the drought monitor triggers at a D3 status, then ELAP kicks in for water hauling, mainly for livestock producers. So <clears throat> they would be, once the D3 status uh, triggers under the drought monitor, then the producers are eligible to come in and apply for assistance. If they have to haul water to their dirt tanks, to their other tanks, or if they have to buy water or bring it in, uh, to haul it for their livestock, and that's to help compensate uh, those producers under water hauling for ELAP. Um, ELAP covers a lot of other areas. For instance, it would cover all the private uh, losses on wildfire if instead of if it was on a private land or state land where LFP would only cover the losses for wildfire under the um, federal side. Uh, ELAP also covers honey and honeybee production for losses due to eligible loss conditions which are mainly, again, it would be like freeze, uh, adverse weather events that are associated with that. Um, our other uh, program that uh, doesn't get utilized very much or very often, but it is available is our TAP. It's the tree assistance program. Um, mostly the vineyards in the state, Southern New Mexico and even Northern New Mexico uh, take advantage of TAP during adverse weather events. Again, this isn't a drought related uh, program, but it is an adverse weather event program. So due to freeze, due to excessive moisture, uh, anything that would be considered an adverse weather event on, on trees, on vines, uh, would fall under TAP. It doesn't replace the actual value of the, uh, of the tree or the vine, it replaces the replacement value. So it wouldn't replace a large tree that's already been mature, it would just do a seedling uh, that it would, the cost that it would take to re, regrow and replant on an orchard or a vineyard. Um, and then our one program that is actually, <clears throat> which is our uh, non-insured agricultural program, which is NAP, is actually, it's not an insurance program. Everybody kind of uh, thinks of it as an insurance program. It's a price support pro or it's a support program. And 
<clears throat> it does have a fee associated with it, which means that producers will need to actually apply and submit an application for coverage prior to the application closing dates, depending on the crop that they want to insure, uh, for lack of a better term. <clears throat> they would pay their, their fee associated with, um, with the crop that they're wanting to cover. And then based on criteria uh, established in the Farm Bill and, and under the NAP policy program, uh, they, if there was an eligible loss event, again, drought does not, <clears throat> there's, there's two different types of, of, of crops that are listed. Uh, it depends on how you certify your crops under the NAP program. Um, if you certify it as irrigated acreage, then it is, <clears throat> NAP does not cover irrigated uh, crops. So the loss due to irrigated crops due to drought. And so <clears throat> that's one program, only eligible loss events due to uh, an adverse weather event would cover a crop under NAP. Drought is covered under non-irrigated crops. So <clears throat> any crops that fall under the non-irrigated issue to include native grass and pasture and range grass uh, falls under the drought category. And so if you have NAP coverage, you could receive in drought conditions, you could receive um, compensation for losses associated with non-irrigated crops. Uh, Royce had mentioned what we do with Cocoa Ross. Um, we really push specifically on the native grass side for forage losses. Uh, we, we really tell people to participate in Cocoa Ross because we do utilize Cocoa Ross, Prism, uh, all of those drought indexes to uh, establish uh, grazing losses and also to confirm grazing losses based on precipitation uh, throughout the state. So the more Coco Ross uh, participants that we have, the better data we get as far as rain and precipitation data that we have. Um, the last program that I just wanted to touch upon, uh, again, it, it doesn't deal with drought, but it deals with everything that's going on currently is our CFAP2 program, which uh, is open. Uh, and has a deadline date of December 11th. So we do wanna make that a, uh, known to uh, as many producers uh, throughout the state that uh, you could be eligible for CFAP2 um, based on the, this is the coronavirus uh, food assistance program. And this is the second program and it does pay out on livestock and specialty crops and also uh, yield-based crops. So <clears throat> if you, have or are farming in any of those. And this is basically just solely on production and things that have happened during the coronavirus. So uh, we just wanna make sure that everybody does uh, put in for that. It's not, a, it's not a drought related issue, but it is a program that we offer. So uh, especially under NAP. So whenever we're looking at NAP, we, we offer, I did say that you have to pay fees associated with it and you have to pay premiums because it is kind of an insurance-based program. But there are ways to uh, mitigate that. So if you're a beginning farmer or rancher or you fall under a socially disadvantaged group, uh, you can receive a waiver for uh, participating in the NAP program where it could possibly either reduce your, your fees or, uh, or possibly not even uh, require you to pay anything to participate in NAP. So we do, uh, tell people to make sure that they submit for that piece. The way we kind of communicate with FSA so you can get all the information from us, uh, a lot of it is through farmers.gov. That's our, our websites that we really do. Um, it's to streamline uh, the information that we have. Again, it allows farmers access to all their applications. They can apply on farmers.gov. Uh, it, it enables easy access to a lot of their information uh, associated with working with FSA and all of USDA. We also use our gov delivery alerts quite a bit to get information out. Uh, we've gone to a paperless system. We don't send very many uh, mailers anymore. Uh, everything's been done uh, electronically. And so we, we do have people asked to sign up for gov delivery so they can get information from their local county offices and get that information uh, emailed to them uh, directly so that they know about deadlines and other programs that we offer. In addition to that, we have text message alerts uh, where you can subscribe to a text message. And we also send out text messages on a regular basis, uh, reminding producers and participants of deadlines and other things that they need to be aware of. 
And basically you text the 372669 number and you put in your state identifier in the county that you're in. And these will be available after, so you can use those. Again, we want you to stay connected with us. And I know I went through that really quick, Marshall, because I know we're running close on time. So I kind of left it there. Thank you very much, Anthony. There's a lot of programs and a lot of information going over. So we, um, we really, really appreciate you being here with us and offering your expect, uh, expertise. So now we'll at, uh, open it up for questions to any presenter. Um, please, if you do put a question into the Zoom chat, make sure you identify which presenter you're asking the question of. Um, and we will, and the presenters have been gracious enough to stay till the end and answer all, all of our, all the questions. We do have one question that came into the chat. Um, please repeat the waiver for so, socially disadvantaged. So, but <clears throat> within the office, so when you, when you come into the office, uh, you want to, if you if you fall in one of the socially disadvantaged groups or beginning farmer or rancher or U.S. veteran, um, the socially disadvantaged uh, tends to be um, social economic impacted. Uh, if you're Hispanic or from a, a representative group, uh, women. Um, I'm trying to remember all the rest of them, but if you fall within one of the socially disadvantaged groups, basically what that does is NAP has a fee associated with it. So you have to pay an annual fee for every for the crops that you want to have covered. And it's $325 per crop per type. And, and then if you wanna buy up coverage up to 100% coverage, you can get a premium, you can pay a premium just like you would on an insurance policy. But if you are under one of the SDA groups, then what you do is it waives that fee, that $325 fee, so you don't have to pay that for the basic coverage, which is 50-55 coverage. And, a, and you only have to pay half or 50% of the premium for any of the buy-up coverages. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, sir. We have another uh, question in the chat. Can producers apply for, emergency, for the emergency loan program this year uh, for the drought? Yes, because we the pretty much every county in the state is under an emergency loan or a, a secretarial designation for their county or an adjoining county. So because of that, yes, they are, uh, they are eligible. You would just need to contact one of our um, farm loan offices. We have four of them. They're, we're, they're kind of broken up by region. So depending on um, where you're at within the state. So for the northern part of the state, most of those are administered out of Estancia out of our Estancia office and we can get you that information if you need. Thank you, sir. While we're waiting for a few more questions to queue up, I just wanna take the opportunity to thank all of our presenters for being on with us tonight. Um, agriculture, of course, has, has many challenges associated with it and prop, water is probably the number one uh, that would that answer if you would ask agricultural producers. And so any kind of information or um, education on, on certain programs that we can, we can use to help combat uh, the challenges associated with water is we'll, we'll take it and use it to our advantage. So thank you all for offering your expertise. Marshall, just real quick, we're gonna go back up to some of the text chat before there was a question and uh, Ms. Paula Garcia did a great job of answering it in the text chat, but I don't know if everybody was paying attention to that. So the question was about the socioeconomic impacts or folks seeing an increase in cost of hay or its availability. And Ms. Garcia uh, answered the question here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and read it for you, Ms. Garcia, if that's all right. The hay yields are 10 to 25% of normal in a lot of the Asakia communities, our field that normally produces 1500 bales only yielded 80 this year. This is in Mora and we only got one cut while most years we get two cuts. The reductions along the Rio Chama were estimated to be about 70%. We got similar reports from Taos of yields of only uh, 25 to 50%. So we can definitely see from this that uh, the water shortages do hurt the uh, socioeconomic 
and have real economic impacts to our communities for sure. So the other part of the text chat that, that came in was some comments about cocoa raws again. Uh, it was alluded to a couple of times uh, through this meeting, uh, but our climatologist, Dave Dubois, uh, kind of runs the cocoa raw program. And if you're a producer and you have programs within the Farm Service Agency, uh, working back with any of these drought programs, having you your rain gauges out and being committed to that program is pretty important for you as a producer, in, in my opinion. And one of the things that it really offers you is the fact that this program allows you to collect the data and input it into a web uh, site. And so it's not just writing down on the napkin and trying to go back in and justify it. It's information that the drought monitor folks and other climatologists use to fill some of the holes um, in some of the data, like uh, Mr. Goudelet pointed out in terms of the pasture rainfall one side and not on the other. So uh, might be some more questions in. Thank you, Tom. We do have another question. I believe this one is for Anthony. Um, are gardens considered in FSA? Our I'm sorry, as far as like, like a home garden or, so we, we have, I mean, if you're in production, if, if you're in production agriculture, you're eligible for our programs and it can get down. I mean, we've had people, depending on what um, they have as far as production agriculture, as in as little as a quarter of an acre, um, we have vineyards that are in a 10th of an acre as far as coverages. So my suggestion is what you would need to do is actually talk to go into your county office and visit with the county executive director or the PT and kind of explain what your production is. Um, if you're producing on a small acreage for farmers markets and you're in actual production his, uh, um, uh, agriculture, then, then yes, you should be eligible. But I would suggest that you go in and talk with the county executive director. So we're not seeing any questions in the text chat. Are there any more questions as you think about that? I wanna thank Marshall Wilson, uh, Janet Woody, Danielle for putting this thing together from the center. And then all of our speakers did an excellent job again tonight. Um, wanna reiterate that the slides and the information we're gonna send out via email to the participants um, after we get it all collected. So. Hopefully tomorrow or maybe the next day, you'll see that. Any further questions? Marshall, you wanna wrap it up? Well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, I just wanna say, have a good evening and stay safe and pray for rain. Thank, Thank you, Marshall. Marshall. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.